I've known Jesus for many, many years now, and uh, it doesn't get old. He doesn't get old. Even singing the, those words this morning, out of ashes, he lifts us up. Wow. Just the incredible, incredible grace of, of God that meets every one of us at our point of need. And then the grace of God that allows us to be on mission for him, to take the message of salvation to a world that needs to hear it. Wow, it's, and some of you are on mission. All of us are on mission, right? We put the watch on in the morning, remember? And every time, in fact, I say it. When I put my watch on, I say, on mission, on mission. You look at your watch during the day, on mission. One lady wrote me and she said, I, I don't wear a watch, so I use my lipstick. <laughs> so... She puts her lipstick on in the morning and she's on mission. She said, I, I freshen it up throughout the day and I'm on mission. Well, I don't wear lipstick, but I do have a watch and we're on mission. Uh, I've been reading your stories and please, uh, I haven't answered any of them yet. Uh, I, I, I want to, but be patient with me. But tell me your stories. A wonderful stories of sharing Jesus on a train and sharing Jesus in, a, in the marketplace, sharing Jesus in one office is being transformed because of one person decided she's gonna share the love of Jesus in her office. Uh, all these, one, one man shared that his son, after 25 years of praying, this, this last week has come to know Jesus as Savior. So this is incredible stories. And can you imagine, folks, the impact we could have if all of us were intentionally on mission? Some of the stories are incredible stories, but all of the stories are in process. And, our, and that's our job, is just to share the story of Jesus. And Jesus saves people we don't. And God, in his wonderful, sovereign way, works out his will and uses you and me to do it. In some of those stories, there, there's going to be adversity coming. I know there is. Because Jesus said, if the world hates me, it's going to hate you. If the world's persecuting me, it'll persecute you because no servant is greater than his master. And we come to that section in the book of Acts in our series on Unstoppable. Uh, it's Acts 18, if you want to join me there, page 927. But it's that story where there's opposition. And in the face of overwhelming opposition, we have to look to the Word of God. We have to. And the Apostle Paul, through his testimony here, shares two things in Acts chapter 18 that are going to help us when we face opposition. The first one is that we have to look for God's redirection. Now let's stop and think for a moment in terms of Paul's past ministry experience. He had come on the second missionary journey, uh, went through Lystra, picked up Timothy. They, they wanted to go into Asia. God said no. He wanted to go to Bithynia. God said no. They heard the Macedonian call and went across into Europe and began to minister there. And as they're ministering in Europe, and Philippi cast a demon out of a girl. And his payment for that was uh, stripped of his clothing and beaten with a wooden rod until he's half dead, thrown in jail, put socks on his feet at midnight, around midnight. He's praising God. You know the rest of the story. Uh, went from there to, to Athens and Thessalonica. In Thessalonica, the persecution was such that he was forced out of the city. It went to Berea, and the Berea trip was much shorter, but the pressure was there and he had to leave. And now he's coming to Corinth. Now, if you've had that track record, you're, you're saying, uh, wow, I don't know if uh, maybe I should have gone into computer science. Um, this ministry thing. And by the way, when you have that string of persecutions, when doors seem to be closed and maybe you don't see the hand of God, you have to fall back on your calling. And that's what Paul was able to do. That Macedonian call, and he knew when he responded that that's where God wanted him to be. And he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. But he's coming into Corinth. He said, it's got to be more of the same. In fact, when he later wrote to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 3, he said, when I came to you, I came weakened and in fear and in trembling. Wow. That's the city. That's the way he's coming to the city. Paul endured a lot of persecution, overwhelming. He writes <clears throat> later in 2 Corinthians 11, 
these words, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty, and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold, without enough clothing to keep warm. And besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. That's his list. What does yours look like? I wrote mine on the opposite side of this card. It's blank. The scars I have for Jesus aren't worth mentioning. They're just not worth mentioning. And yet when I read Paul's list, I watch him expand on that as he writes in 1 Corinthians, uh, actually 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and uh, in verses 17 and 18. Of this list, he says, for this light momentary affliction, are you kidding me? This light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. They're eternal. And he wrote to the Roman believers and he said, I reckon, I think he was from the South, I reckon that the sufferings of this present world aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in me. He knew suffering and adversity. We all face adversity, right? But some of that adversity is because of uh, parents and uh, older parents and uh, aging and not knowing how to best service their needs. Some of that adversity and opposition comes from children who are making some toxic decisions or grandchildren, or it may be financial pressures or it may be physical pressures and it, it brings adversity. That's not the adversity Paul's talking about here. That's, adversity is real, don't get me wrong, but that adversity comes from life, just doing life. This adversity comes from being on mission and being, being opposed on mission. Notice what happens. Let's read the verses, starting in verse number four. And Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. That's where usually where he started. When he came into a city, he would minister to the Jews at the synagogue, reasoning with them and trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that, the, that Christ Jesus, that Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads, I'm innocent, for now I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and, and, uh, and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue, and Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So Paul goes into the synagogues, reasons with them, uh, they revile him, they oppose him, and he said, that's it. And he was open to God's redirection. Jesus, when he was <coughs> did the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, said those words so clearly, he says, you have to understand and use discernment about how much to share with people. In other words, you, you don't take that which is precious and give it to people who aren't ready for the precious things. They don't understand the value. And so he's, he's saying, you take your wedding rings and, and, and throw them into a pig pen. Those pigs don't understand that those rings are worth two, three, four hundred dollars. And... Uh, Let me see. <laughs> they don't understand that, do they? And so he says, don't take that which is really valuable and give it to people who aren't yet ready to understand its value and respond. And so Paul did it. He shared with them the gospel message, shared Jesus is the Christ. They didn't respond. They got angry. He said, that's it. And God was redirecting him. It's interesting, though. When God redirected him, redirected him, and guess who the first convert is? The ruler of the synagogue. 
We've seen that before. When God wouldn't allow uh, Paul to go into the area of Asia and instead send him to Europe, the first convert in Europe was Lydia, who was from Thyatira, which was in Asia. God redirects. There's a verse here, though. I don't want us to skip over. It's a powerful verse. Notice verse number six. And when they opposed him, he took off out his garments and said, and shook them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Those words, shaking out his garments. They did it again on the first missionary journey. Shook out his garments, and he said, I'm leaving. Your blood is on your own heads. What is that all about? The wording comes from an Old Testament passage, or excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 33. In that passage, the prophet is saying that for every city, they need a watchman. And that watchman will sit in the watchtower. And so when people are sleeping, that watchman's always there with eyes open so that if a marauding group of thugs is coming in or an army from another country is coming in with swords drawn to do damage, that watchman has to be alert so that the watchman will blow the trumpet. And the people will hear, will get up, get ready to fight, and the city is preserved. And Ezekiel the prophet said, now, if the, if the watchman blows the trumpet and you hit the snooze alarm waiting for the next trumpet in 10 minutes and the army comes in and destroys you, he said, that's your fault because you didn't respond to the trumpet. But if the armies are coming and the guy in the watchtower is busy sleeping or texting his friends and nothing... And, and he doesn't blow the trumpet. The armies come in and destroy these people. Their blood is on his head. And so what Paul is saying to them, he's saying, I came to you and I blew the trumpet. And you didn't respond. The blood is on your head. That's very, very interesting, isn't it? And is it possible that an almighty God holds us responsible and accountable to share the gospel message, to blow the trumpet. Can you imagine a scenario, assume for a moment that you, you, all of you knew Jesus when you were in high school. Now a reunion is coming, it may be your 10th or your 50th. And you come to the reunion and you meet somebody that you went to high school with and you're good friends in high school. And they say to you, they say, this is, you need to know, that a year ago, two years ago, I came to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Wow! You, you embrace him and you welcome him into the family and you praise God together. And then they step back and they say, uh, like, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me when we were back in high school about Jesus? I had to, I had to spend all these years until somebody else told me. Why didn't you tell me? Can you imagine a more painful scenario? Try this one. That one day, people will stand before the great white throne judgment of Christ who don't know Jesus, and, they'll say, and Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And they say, but why didn't Doug Schmidt tell me? Why didn't Raleigh Kellums tell me? Why didn't Adam Simon tell me? And if we didn't blow the trumpet, perhaps our hands and heads are covered with blood. This isn't meant to make you feel guilty or anything else. It's meant to say, we got a trumpet to blow. We put the watch on, we carry the trumpet to share the gospel message through our good deeds and through our good words. Let's do it well. Let's really do it well. And so God redirected. I remember years ago, one of our guys in the church, uh, Jim McClellan, came to me. We were in the other building, and he said, uh, I, I have a neighbor who needs to know Jesus. Can, he's a football player for the Lions, uh, Chris Spielman. Some of you older people remember Chris Spielman. He played for Ohio State, and then uh, he's forgiven. And then... Uh, <laughs> 
And then he came to play for the Lions and was this outstanding player for the Lions. And Jim said, I want to see my friend Chris come to know Jesus. Can we put together this outing where we can invite dads and their sons and daughters who like football and I can bring my friend and my friend can hear the gospel message. So we invited uh, Mike Singletary, who had just retired as the middle linebacker for the Chicago Bears. You remember those big saucer eyes of intensity. And Mike came. It was on Easter weekend. I'll never forget Easter Sunday morning. Mike shared about a 15-minute story of his own testimony. He started off, keep in mind, you got a big linebacker who comes on the platform, and he, his opening line was this. He said, uh, uh, I'm Mike Singletary, I'm, uh, I'm one of seven children in my family, and he says, I'm the smallest. <laughs> then he said, and that includes my sisters. <laughs> but on the Saturday night he shared, but before he did, it was a day or two days before, I forget, that Chris Spielman called up Jim and said, uh, I can't come. I can't come to the, the dinner tomorrow night. He said, this is for you. God was redirecting. And Jim called another neighbor who plays for the Lions, who just signed as a rookie, a guy by the name of Luther Ellis. And Luther Ellis came along with his brother. And after Mike Singletary shared, both these men accepted Christ as their Savior. It's a story, a wonderful story of God redirecting. One of our men was sharing with me this morning of how he was at a university campus and he was sharing across the table with a man the gospel message. And after he was done sharing, the man just stood up and said thank you and walked away. And he, he just sat there. And then from six feet away at another table, a girl comes over to him and she said, could I pray to accept Jesus? You see, when God directs, he can also redirect. There's so many incredible stories of that. We don't have time this morning to share those. But be, let's be open to God's redirection. Uh, secondly, let's listen. Let's listen for God's encouragement. These are wonderful words here. We go on to verse number nine. Keep in mind, Paul came and he's discouraged, he's weakened, he's in a fear and trembling. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, but I have many in the city who are my people. So he's saying to him these words, You don't have to be afraid. Do you ever hear, have to hear that when you're on mission? Yeah, every day. You don't have to be afraid. Why? He says, Because I am with you. I brought this book with me today. And it's the, pro the promises of God from the Bible, 2,500 promises of God. All of these promises are powerful, but there's one to me that stands out, and it's the one that God shared in a night vision with Paul. He says, I am with you. I am with you. Do you remember this story when Moses came down from the mountain? The people were having this, this orgy, and it was a, an abomination against God as they were worshiping these, these golden calves. And God brought ju judgment. And when he did, <coughs> Moses pleads with God. He said, you're, you're a patient, long-suffering God. Um, let your people live. And at the close of that chapter, Moses says these words to God. If you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. I don't want to take one step. I don't want to drive one mile without you, God. I just don't. Why? Because how will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and your people? If you don't go with us, for your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. Think about it. That we are in the presence of God this morning. He inhabits the praise of his people. And yet when you leave this place, you'll never escape the presence of God. In every moment, in every situation, while you're going, while you're suffering, while you're serving, God goes with you. And you don't need to be afraid. 
It's powerful. Sometime today, would you do this, or at least this week, Psalm 139, read it over. David, the psalmist, in that psalm is praying, and he said, Lord, you know me. You know me, you know me inside and out. And he says, before I speak a word, before it comes out of my, my mouth, you know what it is. Isn't that helpful in sharing Jesus on mission? I don't know what to say. God said, I already know what you're going to say. You're on mission. Say it. And I love those words where he says, uh, it's around verse 5, he says, and you hem me in. You're on my right. You're on my left. You're in front of me. You're behind me. You hem me in. There's no way I can go outside of your presence. And then he uses those words. This is too wonderful and too big for me to comprehend. But because of the promise, he says, keep speaking. Don't be silent. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. Because there are people here that need to know. They are, these are my people. They need to know. <clears throat> And keep doing it. He said, and he goes on to say, there, there'll be people who will attack you. No one's going to attack you to harm you. There would be people who would attack him, but not to harm him as you, as you continue to read through the chapter. What's fascinating about this is he obeyed. Verse number 11, he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Sometimes in the midst of opposition that's overwhelming, we need to listen to the encouraging words of God. Those words can come so often through his word. Maybe they'll come at times in what will seem like a night vision. But often for me, it's been through this book. There are other times they'll come through people and come through the church. Uh, There have been a couple times over the years where I've just felt such opposition and adversity in being on mission for Jesus. One of them was many, many years ago. And I couldn't will myself out of it or through it as much as I tried. And one of the elders of the church shared with me a verse that I'll never forget. It's it's Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. He says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous. But God, I don't feel strong and courageous. He said, read the verse. It doesn't say feel it. He said, I've commanded you. Be strong and courageous. But how do I do that? He says, I'm with you. You can do it. And those words over and over and over again sank deep within my heart. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. And I knew that I could be strong and courageous because God was with me wherever I went. I think I told you the story. I know I shared it in Thrive uh, just a few weeks ago. It was another time, more recently, it was last summer. It was a horrible, horrible week, perhaps one of the worst weeks I've had in trying to be on mission for Christ. Uh, I'm not sure you, sure all the details, you'll be bored more than normal. And, um, but it was, it was just a bad week, a loss of a lot of sleep, big decisions that uh, were going to affect a lot of people. And I remember um, Friday, some of it was starting to come together. But I was, by, at that point, I was just empty. And I called my wife and said, uh, uh, let's just go out tonight. and Give me a half hour to just download. And so... I got home probably late afternoon. Um, uh, we, have, we have one of those 2008 G6 Pontiac convertible tops, and so we put the top down. It was hot. She allowed me to download for a half hour. We put a period there and then had fun. We drove up uh, M15 past 69 and up and through those little towns and uh, up by Frankenmuth and stopped and played miniature golf. I whooped her (laughs) by a stroke. Her story is she let me win, but now you and I know differently. And then we we continued to drive. The time passed, and now it's 9, 9.30. We hadn't eaten yet. 
So we pulled into a little, uh, little restaurant a long way from Troy, Michigan. And we ate a meal. And they, they, they brought over the bill and laid it on the table. And a guy comes over and he picks it up. And he says, I'm paying for that. And uh, I, I stood up and said, uh, why? Why are you paying for that? And he said, because God told me to. My first thought was, why doesn't God do that more often? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say anything. But he said, uh, God told you to? He says, yeah. I said, well, I'm a pastor. He said, I know you're a pastor. I said, how do you know I'm a pastor? He said, I'm sitting over there, and God tells me, go over and pay this guy's bill, because he's a man of God, and he needs encouragement. I haven't seen that guy. I never saw him before. I haven't seen him since. I looked to see if he had wings. Because he was God's messenger. And God's voice to me that night was as clear as a night vision for Paul. It was as clear as Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. He says, you don't need to be afraid. Don't be silent. And don't stop speaking. Blast the trumpet. Blast the trumpet that our hands and heads may be clear on mission for Jesus. Can you imagine the impact, folks? If, if every one of us went on mission this week, we strapped on our watch or we put on our lipstick. <laughs> on mission, on mission. Sharing the love of Jesus, blowing the trumpet of the gospel so clearly with our good deeds and with our good words that people have to somehow respond. It may not always be good, but maybe it will be. Let's do it this week. Our God and our, our Father, I'm thankful today for this incredible promise that you're with us always, even till the end of the earth. Lord, I pray that we would recognize that truth today, tomorrow, every day of this week and next as we're on mission. Father, use us to write the stories of salvation in the lives of other people. And we'll thank you and praise you and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.